Thanks, Mr. Director, and let me start close to home, Highland Park, 4th of July, idyllic American holiday, families watching a parade in a wonderful town that I'm honored to represent. In comes a shooter with an AR-15, perches himself on a roof, fires away. We think 83 rounds were delivered in a matter of a minute or less. At the net result, of, of course, is not only seven dead and scores wounded, but wounds that will be there for a long time. Yesterday, a little nine-year-old boy named Cooper Roberts, who was shot by this gunman with one of these assault rifles, was released from the hospital. This poor little boy, absent a miracle, is going to be paralyzed for life. You've mentioned that this isn't the only instance where assault rifles are being turned in, on people in innocent situations. I could go through the same list you have and add even more. I won't do that. But I'm also noticing more and more that our law enforcement officials themselves are more vulnerable because of these assault rifles. Bullets fired from an AR-15 AR are powerful enough to pierce soft body armor, the form most commonly used by police. Bullets fired by Sig Sauer MCX Spear have an even greater range than the traditional AR-15 and can pierce nearly all kinds of body armor, including those stronger than what is typically worn by law enforcement. The bottom line is this proliferation of guns, particularly assault weapons, is deadly and dangerous when it comes to our law enforcement. What is your observation? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, there are an awful lot of really dangerous people out there. And in some days, I will say to those of us in law enforcement, it seems like there are more and more of them. Uh, and those people are only more dangerous with more dangerous weapons. Um, and certainly, uh, I know just, just this week, um, we had a couple of our agents uh, who were, were shot at uh, with, uh, I believe, an assault rifle uh, that, uh, you know, multiple rounds penetrating the vehicle they were in. Thankfully, thankfully, they were not injured, but I worry every day uh, about that. Um, and I know that my counterparts, my, my fellow uh, law enforcement leaders, chiefs and sheriffs worry about it all the time as well. Uh, we, we are all trying to do the best we can with, uh, with better and better protective equipment, better and better training, uh, better and better munitions of, of, of our own. Uh, but certainly it is a dangerous world out there and the statistics that I cited um, in my opening statement uh, are illustrative of what a dangerous job it is out there for law enforcement. And one of the points that I didn't make in my opening statement that is of that 73, that were murdered on the line of duty, in the line of duty last year, uh, an alarming percentage of those were killed uh, in effect in, in types of ambush situations. Not unlike our task force officer uh, in Indiana who was ambushed, I think he was out on a lunch break outside our office. So um, I, I worry about our folks every day. Um, and I will tell you that the hardest thing I've ever had to do, certainly in this job, uh, is sit and talk with the families of, of our fallen. One of the most outrageous examples of violence against law enforcement occurred right here in the U.S. Capitol complex on January 6, 2021, when an insurrectionist mob attacked the men and women who were trying to defend me and us in this building. A net result of it, at least five people died and over 140 law enforcement were injured. It has resulted in, I think, the largest prosecution in Department of Justice history. The numbers now are 850 suspects have been arrested. But the FBI is still trying to identify more than 350 suspects believed to have committed violent acts on the criminal on the Capitol grounds. That is the same number of unidentified suspects that were reported. 10 months, one year, and 14 months after the event. What has made it so difficult to identify these 350 additional suspects? Well, I think in, in some instances, the, the, a lot of the initial people that we were able to find uh, and arrest and charge uh, made themselves widely visible and easily identifiable um, on social media or otherwise, uh, but there were certain number of people who concealed themselves more effectively. And so part of it is a little more challenging to get those people identified. That's part of it. 
Um, and then, of course, as I have to be a little bit careful what I say here, but we are continuing to develop some of the more complicated parts of the investigation in terms of conspiracy charges and that sort of thing. So that may also contribute to some of it. One of the other elements was whether or not the FBI and others should have been forewarned of what was going to occur on January 6th. Would you like to comment on that? Well, uh, I would say two things. One, we uh, and DHS were both throughout 2020 uh, putting out intelligence products warning about the prospect uh, of uh, different forms of politically motivated uh, violence, including related to the election, including uh, even after the election, potentially related to January 6th. Uh, but it is also the reality uh, that we did not have, I think, any specific credible intelligence that uh, pointed to uh, thousands of people um, breaching the Capitol. Uh, and so one of the things that we are determined to do uh, on our part to make sure we can do our part to make sure that nothing like that ever happens again is to see how we can go about developing better sources. Anytime in the intelligence field uh, when there is any kind of successful attack, uh, we make a point of trying to figure out are there better ways to develop sources, Let higher ask, quality sources, et cetera. So we're question. doing that now. If I can ask you a question on that, given the extensive online planning for the violence on January 6th, I was surprised to hear Jill Sanborn, the FBI's former counterterrorism head, say last year that it is not within the FBI's authorities to monitor publicly available social media conversations. How do you reconcile this with the Attorney General's guidelines, which authorize the FBI to, quote, proactively surf the internet to find publicly available websites where the promotion of terrorist crimes are openly taking place? Well, as you reference, uh, what we can and cannot do is largely uh, covered in the Attorney General guidelines, and I think to some extent also in what we call the DIAG. Uh, and it's a more complicated topic in terms of what we can and cannot do than I can get into in the time remaining. But what I would say, and I think what former EAD Sanborn was trying to say, is that we don't uh, have authority to persistently and, and passively just sit on the internet monitoring social media. It's more complicated than that, but with proper predication and an authorized purpose, there are things we can do in terms of uh, publicly available social media. But it's a, a longer, more involved topic than I could really do justice to here. Well, I'm not an expert in this area by any means, but it seems to me that the use of artificial intelligence by other agencies has made this a more efficient operation. Is that being considered by the FBI? Absolutely. You're spot on that artificial intelligence is, uh, just as it is in, in the private sector and in other fields, artificial intelligence is an incredibly important tool. The FBI, just like other organizations, has uh, a big data problem, uh, and artificial intelligence is an important, important tool as we go forward to being better at getting through the mountains of information that, that's out there uh, in a more efficient and effective way. Thank you. Senator Grassley? Uh, 